or vice versa. Uh, I like Jonathan Haidt's moral foundation theory. You can go to moralfoundation.org and read about it yourself, uh, or you can go take his little moral dimensions test in which he's uh, done this on hundreds of thousands of subjects now, and he's five moral dimensions. And uh, these are the dimensions that people care most about when they, when they are asked about what, what, what they care about in politics and economics and society. One, harm care. That is, we have an, we, we're an evolved mammalian attachment system. We have an evolved mammalian attachment system. And it means we can feel the pain of others. So we, we care about other people, and, and we don't want harm to come to them. <coughs> Two, fairness and reciprocity. That is the evolution of reciprocal altruism. It is, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine. Generates a sense of justice. We have a, a sense of right and wrong. It's, it's evolved into us. It doesn't come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up through evolution. Uh, and so uh, we want to right wrongs uh, and make sure that everybody is treated fairly uh, in our system. Three, in-group uh, loyalty. That is, we've evolved an in-group tribalism, which leads to patriotism, dedication to the group. I can count on you as a fellow group member. I know you're a friend, not a turncoat or a traitor. Four, authority and respect. That is, evolved hierarchical social structures translates to respect for authority and tradition. That is, if we're going to stick together as a group and take care of each other against the harsh environment and other dangerous groups, then I have to uh, I have to know you're going to obey the same rules I'm going to obey. That if I cooperate, you have to cooperate. If you defect, brings us all down. If there's too many cheaters in our system, the group won't hold together. Therefore, we have to punish uh, violators and cheaters and free riders and so on. And then five, purity, sanctity, evolved emotion of disgust related to disease and contaminations probably underlies the sense of bodily purity. Whether you're conservative and, you're, and you care about the purity of of the body sexually, uh, or if you're a liberal and you carry about the purity of the body through uh, food and environment and air and things like that. Okay, what Jonathan found, interestingly, uh, is that uh, they kind of cluster into two groups. That is, the harm, care, and fairness, reciprocity, the sort of a moral focus on individual rights, and three, four, and five, in-group loyalty, authority, respect, and purity. Sanctity is kind of the moral focus on group cohesiveness. So instead of thinking of somebody as being right or wrong uh, on moral political issues, just think of, well, he cares more about that, and I care more about this. So these are all important values. Um, the most interesting part of Jonathan's findings is the difference between liberals and conservatives. Liberals tend to emphasize one and two, individual morality, and conservatives tend to emphasize all five, but slightly more three, four, and five over one and two findings. And it looks like this. This is for the United States. Ignore the ends. Uh, these ends are now several years old. They're in the hundreds of thousands of now. Again, you can go to his web page. You can take it. You can add your own data. Point to the set. It's in the hundreds of thousands of now. But basically, as you move from left to right, uh, you get this shift from, on the far left, the concern of harm and fairness over authority and group and purity, and conservatives tend to cluster on all five together. And this is true in the United States, in Canada, pretty consistently in the UK, in Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Latin America, Muslim Middle East, East Asia, and South Asia. So it's pretty consistent that these are the kinds of things people care about, and these are the kinds of different tribal clusters you get of what people care about morally and, and politically. Um, so tribalism is ugly. Um, the problem with just saying, well, we should get rid of tribalism is that it, 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 the basis of it is group cohesiveness. We're, we're, as Aristotle said, we're a social animal. We're a social primate species. It's, and it's what makes us powerful. It allows us to do what we're able to do because we're, otherwise we're kind of puny little primates compared to the predators on the plains of Africa. Um, in any case, since 9-11, the game has changed. We, you cannot afford to abandon loyalty and authority. And so uh, we live in a world with tribes, and on those tribes uh, are, are separated by walls, and on those walls are men with guns. <laughs> so uh, to end this little middle portion of the lecture, uh, my favorite example is this sort of division between 
the two clusters of moral values between liberals and conservatives, say, in, in pop culture anyway, is uh, the Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise film, A Few Good Men. I'm sure most of you have seen this already, but just to refresh your memory, I'll show a short, short clip of this, sort of the climax of the trial of the... So, uh, Jack Nicholson's character, the sort of battle-hardened Marine Colonel Nathan R. Jessup, is on trial. Uh, because a couple of his uh, Marines under his charge uh, roughed up a sort of disloyal Marine uh, and things got out of control and, and, and he died. So these two Marines are on trial for their life and they've called in Jack Nicholson, who they want to, who the Cruz characters, who's sort of the liberal Navy uh, lawyer, wants to try and see if he can get uh, the Nicholson character for ha actually having given this order, sort of an off the books called a code red. You know, where this guy is not pulling his weight, the band of brothers is going to fall apart if we don't all stick together. We can't have disloyalty. We need loyalty in our group. So the little conversation that they have at the end of the movie, I think nicely summarizes that, that tribal difference there and how in, in many ways you need uh, both. Um, okay, so for this we need to pump up the sound a little bit because the, the recording was a little low. There we go. Uh, he's not thinking about Scientology there. <laughs> just, just don't even think about that. <laughs> the less I know about celebrities' personal life, the better. <laughs> it's always bad news. Anyway, okay, so here we go. Uh, so let's put that uh, volume in. The judge, the court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendall gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendall go to the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendall to do. I'm Jeff, what are you doing, man? You call these guys loose, Your Honor. You want to try to avoid a train? Your Honor, you doctor the long book. Dad, can you call us a doctor? Do you do you Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. <laughs> You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! <laughs> Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's gonna do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago, and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You had the luxury of not knowing what I know. But Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the matter in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. You're the code red. I did the job. Did you know what I'm right? You're goddamn right I did! Got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, well, obviously, it would be better if we didn't have to have walls with men with, men with guns on them, but that's not the world we live in. I'm not sure we're anywhere close to getting out of that world that we live in. I think we're not. It's a long time coming. Uh, and so, really, you need both uh, sets of moral values. And so, instead of thinking the left or right is wrong or right, just think of them as clustered that way, as one uh, real-life Marine colonel told me. It's easy to be a liberal against war when you have men with guns on the walls guarding you and your freedom to believe that. So, okay. That's the, the heavy part of it. <laughs> um, so, returning to where we were. Um, so I'm going to go back to uh, back to the uh, patternicity part and uh, and talk about uh, priming, priming the brain. Uh, that is how we form these beliefs and how difficult it is uh, to get around the fact that uh, much of the world is hard to understand. 
So let's just start with something fun like this. If you already know there's a Dalmatian dog there, it's pretty easy to see. If you don't, it just looks like a bunch of random watches. So the, the, the theory, the concept determines the percepts. Here's the, the head. That's his ear. That's a collar. Uh, let's see. And uh, here's his back. That's a front leg and a back leg.